And it's just, can you even conceive of anything other than God that could fit within the ultimate definition as you have put it? Um, without trying to be evasive, can you expand on what you mean by conceive? But I imagine, um, think about, uh, it's a good point. I hadn't thought about like, yeah. You see, I, I, the view, the view that I take and other Christian theologians, not that I'm a theologian take is that once we are acquainted with, uh, God's disclosure of himself in creation, which is open to everybody. Um, and God's special revelation, right? If that is rejected upon um, becoming acquainted with it, then what that means is instantaneously the individual is opting for a figment of their imagination. Um, as one theologian put it, he, he says that it is an idolatrous construct. That any other worldview other than the Christian worldview, you are holding out that something else uh, is the ground of being other than the God who is and who has revealed himself. So whatever you have a mental um, appropriation for, it's it's an idol because it 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 putatively supplants God. So. I just don't call it an idolatrous construct. I mean, I do, but sometimes that will go over people's heads, and they're you know they're not. I, I think people who are more biblically minded will accept that, but people who aren't biblical minded, when you say it's an idolatrous construct, they just think that that's a Christian cliche. So I've opted, to, in addition to saying that, to saying that it's a figment of their imagination. There will be no identifiable and defensible ultimate to appeal to. Okay. Somebody may attempt to invoke such a uh, state of affairs or entity that replaces God in terms of being what is metaphysically primary, but how are they going to instantiate it? Okay. How are they going to establish its ontological actuality and its metaphysical intelligibility? Now, I know unbelievers, you know, snark when I say that, but what they can't snark at is I'm being entirely consistent with the Christian worldview, because what I just said necessarily follows in the case that the Christian worldview is true. That any other worldview and whatever its putative ultimacy is, the ground of being, will just simply be a figment of their imagination. And since it would be a, simply a figment of their imagination, it is not something that they will be able to identify and defend. That does help me understand it a little bit, actually. So, because like I'm trying to consider what could possibly fit within your ultimate definition and i haven't been able to think of anything that would be in any way different from the way god is okay ultimate for those of you who are, are new here ultimate refers to that which is the ground of all existence that is fundamental foundational uh, absolute within itself unconditionally non-dependent from which all other things that are not ultimate derive and depend now that's a bit wordy, but I'm adding that wordiness for clarification purposes. Because when I ask people, since they don't believe that God is ultimate, what what is it that's ultimate? And frequently people just don't understand or they don't want to understand. So from a Ventilian point of view, Cornelius Ventil, the theologian and apologist, um, ultimacy is, is what everything fundamentally derives from. What what I like, what I ask professional atheists is, what is it then that institutes all instances of what is, can be, and cannot be? What is it? If it is not God, what is it? Now, at least Lawrence Krauss, to his credit, the the foaming at the mouth firebrand atheist, he says, "Well, I don't know. Why does it even matter?" But we have these schmucks on Clubhouse and on Discord who they know that they don't know. But they'll blurt out reality 
or the universe or the cosmos or energy. But they know that this is a figment of their imagination. How would they ground that? Right. To your credit, Darth, you have gotten me to the position similar to Krauss's of saying... Don't say that. Don't say that because you're going to make atheists have hemorrhoidal attacks if you if you give me a compliment. Darth, you have very nice hair, I'm sure. I used to have a nice head of hair. I mean, I, I've got a ponytail halfway down my back, so I'm winning this one. No, I, no, I, I haven't reached that... Uh that level yet of uh, uh, growing a ponytail so but i used to have a nice set of hair but being that i'm an old fogey it's slowly going away so anyway the point the point is don't compliment darth dawkins because you will inflict hemorrhoidal pain upon atheists ah uh, they can deal with it they're used to it okay well we can give them a little cheese with their wine uh so the the, the bottom line is just just assume just for the sake of argument that the Christian worldview is true. Then it follows that when God reveals himself through creation and through human history, providentially and infallibly secured in the Christian scriptures, that God's communication of himself both directly and indirectly is not something that is deniable. And by deniability, I mean that the deniability is instantiated. Okay, I mean, surely someone can say, well, oh, I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe the biblical worldview, right? That, that's a verbal denial. But when I, when I say denial, I'm meaning that the denial is actually instantiated, right? Since, right, so like since, any denial I have would be a personal denial and not a, like, denial of all of it, I suppose. It's, it's like saying. this. Suppose I, I've been using this illustration recently. I walk into a pawn shop and I say, I have a piece of American Civil War memorabilia and it's a rare piece. What will you give me for it? And the owner says, nothing. I said, well, why not? Don't you buy a war, 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 excuse me, war memorabilia? He says, yeah, I do. But that's made of entirely of plastic. It's not Civil War memorabilia. Plastics didn't exist then. You see, I made a claim, a verbal claim that, you know, it was Civil War memorabilia. But beyond the verbal utterance of it, there was no instantiation that it actually was what I verbalized. So unbelievers can verbally invoke the denial of God, but they cannot um, unpack and instantiate the, 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 the denial. This is why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and in chapter 3, three of Corinthians, has not God turned the wisdom of the world into foolishness? Right. And That's I suppose simple. this is where you get to asking about competing worldviews as opposed to them falsifying yours. You start to falsify theirs. Well, generally speaking, most of the people that I'm dealing with are quite familiar with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're quite familiar with the basics of the Bible. That there's one God who has created this world. He has communicated his existence, dealt with the nation of Israel, and finally incarnated himself in Jesus Christ, died on the cross and rose again for the forgiveness of our sins. And he's coming again to judge the living and dead. And they reject that. So generally speaking, there's not a need to go over that. But in order to show that this is true, I show that the denial thereof is just simply impossible. The self-identity claims of Jesus Christ, when they are understood in their proper context, right, from a biblical presuppositional perspective, are irrefutable and undeniable. And they're irrefutable because in order to affirm or deny anything, you're going to need a model of reality. You're going to need a system. So if you're going to deny the Christian worldview as a package deal, if you're going to deny the identity claims of Jesus, then what is your worldview out of which you're speaking, claiming that you can affirm and deny things? Are you Just actually there? asking me? No, I didn't think you were actually asking. I didn't hear your last two sentences. I, I, I was responding with a joke. Carry on. Sorry. Okay. Okay. 
that. And and to be clear, Dom, right. like I, I I think the piece I'm missing of your puzzle is I don't have any special relevation that I'm consciously aware of. And you might not like that sentence, but it's well, my honest because, truth. Well, that well, you said special revelation. You are acquainted, and by the by the way, Bent, just gonna let let you know, uh, because this is a, a new platform that you're on here with me. You're, I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt, but if you do your trolling, you'll be forever banned. Okay. Um, so. What were you again saying, Stephen? You're not conscious of what? Of a special revelation. Okay, so are you familiar with the basics of the Bible? Oh yes, I've read the book. Okay, so you are conscious of the of the special revelation, but you are just in your mind denying that it constitutes special revelation. So it's not it's not simply that you're not aware of it. You're you're the basis upon which you're saying you're not aware of it is that the basic content of the biblical revelation that you're acquainted with, and I say revelation as it presents itself, that you have decided it is unworthy of accepting of how it presents itself. So contained with your statement, I'm unaware, is actually a denial that the basics of the Christian worldview as detailed in the biblical documents is that it's unworthy of accepting its self-identity claim. So then, so then, if it is unworthy, then what is the worldview that you're operating from when you evaluate any text at all, including the Bible? Why would any belief be worthy or unworthy in your worldview? What would be your final reference point? If it is not the mind of God and how he reveals it in creation and through history, what will be your ultimate reference point, your final court of appeal, as to make whatever proposition is worthy or unworthy? I'm not he, sure that I know what the ultimate reference point is. Then, 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 you have no, then you have no coherent grounds, given your model of reality, to claim that you're making intelligible propositions. Given, given your system. Now, I do believe you make coherent propositions, like if you go to McDonald's and order some French fries, you know, or, or some other thing, but that's because you're in God's world. But when you, when you communicate to me, you are in no need of that God when you do make proposition. I'm, I'm going to take you seriously and say, good, tell me how your propositional content is therefore uh, intelligible given your god free model of reality because see in order to invoke facts requires a philosophy of fact and in order to have a philosophy of fact you must have a concept uh, of, of of your world or an ontology but there will be no ontology for for which you to identify and defend so therefore you have no way to ground facts or propositions By the way, for new people who are in the room, the title refers to the fact that, yes, atheists do hate God because they know that God exists, because God has undeniably revealed himself through creation and human history. And atheists irrationally claim they don't know God when they do. That atheism, however they characterize their unbelief, is intellectually and philosophically indefensible. So then that means that their non-belief will either be, no, James, you're not coming up. You, you're going to have to grow a few brain cells. The last time you were up here, you were just bickering and argumentative, okay? So you're going you're gonna to have to show me sometime in the future that you're more mature, okay? All right, would you like to say something, Ben? Okay, goodbye to the audience. Okay. Okay, would anyone else like to come up? So the, the, bot the bottom line is, is this. When you don't accept the biblical revelation, when you don't accept Jesus Christ's identity claims, 
then whatever you say, I'm going to use against you. I'm going to ask you, how is what you are saying make any sense? How does it possess intelligibility given your model of reality? And there's nowhere for you to go. Yeah, everything I say is going to end up being solipsistic, basically. But solipsism itself is not coherent. Because solipsism would be saying, well, the only thing I know is my consciousness. But the consciousness is actually referring to a collection of chronological mental states. Well, what unifies them? Okay. Well, that's why I was saying earlier, I'm not sure I can know what the ultimate thing is or that I have to know it. Those are two separate questions. I'm not you're sure not, I can answer you're, them. Okay, you're, not, uh, you're not understanding. Okay. Always keep in mind that my criticism and my debunking of all non-Christian worldviews is always juxtaposed to that of the Christian worldview. So in the Christian worldview, the actuality and intelligibility of the grass blowing in the wind is only in virtue that it originates and is sustained by the mind, the purposes, and the redemptive plan of God. Okay? So the actuality of grass blowing in the wind and its intelligibility is rooted that it starts in the mind of God. Grass would not be grass if it did not start in the mind of God and was imposed and sustained by the sovereignty and providence of God. On the other hand, if somebody says, no, I don't need God, I can invoke grass blowing in the wind as being actual and intelligible without the necessity of referencing the necessity of God being the final reference point. So good. What is your ontological basis for grass? Because you can't have intelligibility without ontology and you can't have you can't have it vice versa so you believe that you are you don't need god okay fine then when you say you don't need god you're making an implicit counterclaim that your worldview suffices to speak intelligibly right is that what you believe No, I don't. I, I believe my worldview does speak intelligibly, like obviously. Okay, so what is what is what is your ontology that will provide for the intelligibility? Intelligibility is a byproduct of the ontology, both on a grand and on a local scale. So, what is your ontology? Can, can you remind me ontology? I keep I keep mixing up a step. Ontology is simply just the nature of being. Okay. It could be on a grand or on a small scale. So, for example, we could talk about the ontology of humans or frogs. Or we could talk about the ontology of time space or of the nature of I suppose, everything within the, what we call reality. Yeah, my, my first ontology would probably be that I only have evidence of physical things. Well, evidence requ requires certain uh, fundamental parameters, such as identity, identity over time the causal principle, and the regularity of nature. Are those real? Those concepts, yeah. Okay. Do you accept that God is the one who institutes and secures that? I do not accept that, no. Good. Then what makes them real? Well, the concepts refer to how reality works. So... They're no, 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 no. Stop. Okay. You're, 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 that you're, listen, 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 listen to me. You're doing what unbelievers do all the time, okay? You're saying, well, you see, this is exactly what um, Gordon Stein said in his debate with Greg Bonson, and he got trounced. He goes, well, that's just the way things work. That's just the way reality is. So you're just saying, well, these fu fundamental parameters are real. Well, are they real in and of themselves? Are they absolute and unconditionally non-dependent and derivative? Or are these fundamental parameters derivative? Because you're telling me they're real. I want to know why they're real. Are they real in and of themselves? Or are these fundamental parameters that I've mentioned, identity, identity over time, the causal principle, uniformity of nature, are they brute facts? And by that, I mean that they just simply are, but there's no internal or external reason as to why they are. They just are.
I would say they're more probably brute facts than anything else, but I wouldn't be able to be sure well, about well, it. Well, well, here's the deal. What we have is a true dichotomy here. Either the facts in question, that is those facts that do not refer to God, right? Either facts will be categorized and conceptualized as creaturely, meaning they're derivative from the mind, the purpose, and the plan of God, or not. I'm sure you would agree with that dichotomy, right? Uh, I think so. Okay. Now, if they're not, then what you're going to be left with is that any fact that you invoke will be, upon evaluation, a brute fact. It has no identifiable reason why it is either internally that it would be self-contained or externally that it would be derivative from an identifiable and defensible ultimate source. And if they're brute facts, then they're uninterpretable. Okay, And by uninterpretable, I don't mean that somebody comes along and says, well, you see, I call that a red Ferrari. Okay, or I call that an, a vanilla ice cream cone. We're not talking about the human conceptualizations that are verbalized or projected onto the thing in question. The question is, is what is the actuality of the thing that is invoked? Okay, what is the actual ontology of the thing in question? Not just the ideas that the human mind would like to lay upon it. Okay. Like, for example, just recently, a, a software developer at Google was just, um, I don't think he was suspended. He was put on leave because he Fired. was claiming that, I'm sorry, what? Uh, the guy who said his AI was um, conscious, he was fired. Sentient. Yeah. Oh, he, they he actually, they, they finally fired him? I believe so. Okay, because I heard he was he was given a leave of absence. But that's it. It doesn't matter. Okay. So, so the so the question is: Is his conceptual overlay of those computer processes are is that what they actually are in and of themselves sentient? Right. It may be the case that the conceptualization is an accurate reflection of the ontology of the thing in question, but the mere human conceptualization doesn't make it so. So when I so when you reject that God has revealed Himself in creation, and revealed Himself through human history, through through the Christian scriptures, and ultimately Jesus Christ, you have a world that you think is interpretable, but upon investigation, it is uninterpretable. Okay, I'm honestly still wrestling with that dichotomy. I'm not sure. How I square that circle, honestly. What, what um, would be the third option? Yeah, I, I don't know. If there is one, well, I don't know how I, I would. Well, I've done it. Well, you, you certainly you accept the law of excluded middle, right? Something is either A or not A. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. So something is either uh, categorized in, a, in actuality. It's either creaturely or not. And creaturely meaning that it is derivative of the mind, the purpose, and the redemptive plan of God. If it is not, then it is in the category of not creaturely. It's either creaturely or not creaturely. Right. And when I said that I don't feel like I, I'm not conscious of any special motivation to myself, what I mean is that God hasn't told me personally that he exists. Right. Like I've read the Bible. I've looked into the are arguments. You talking, are you talking about audibly? I suppose it could be audible. There's multiple okay, ways well, well, for God well, to do so. I don't. I don't know. I don't know of any living. Well, there are some people that are a little bit wacky, but uh, uh, generally speaking, in Christianity, we're not. We're not appealing to an audible communications by God. We're referring to God's revealing of Himself in and through creation and through human history recorded uh, in the Bible. Uh, Bent, are you there? Yeah, Ben, you can go ahead. I'm eating, so I, I've got to take seconds here to eat. Yeah, I just want to find out if you're going to do your usual uh, trolling, if you've grown up or not. Okay, if you choose not to respond to me, you won't be back up again. Okay, have it your way. 
He just he, he just was talking on the back back too, so he's around. No, he's a vi- he's a vile person. Okay, he's a very vile person. But even in spite of my harshest crit- critics, sometimes I'm willing to give people a second chance. Right. All right, James, I'm going to bring you up against my better judgment, but you better you better up your intellectual game. Okay. Ah, oh, I didn't even raise my hand. Thanks for bringing me up, Darth. Well, you did before. I did? Oh. Yeah, your hand uh, was, I was raised ty- before. I was, typing in, I was typing in chat. I was just saying that uh, me as an atheist, I don't personally hate God. I just don't believe in a God or gods or anything supernatural. I have no hatred towards any of the ideology of gods or gods. Okay, well, my my position is that you do hate God. The Bible teaches this. And because you hate God, you don't want to acknowledge and believe in him. So what you do is you resort to what the Bible calls the suppression of truth and unrighteousness, which is nothing more than a figment of your imagination. In other words, your atheist conceptualizations are without rational justification, which is indicative of the fact that you don't want to acknowledge that God is and that he's revealed himself. So in order to instantiate that you don't hate God, you're going to have to explain to me how it is that you've determined that the the creation itself does not reveal God. How did you make a determination that facts are standalone? Not quite sure I understand what you're trying to ask me. Well, everybody has a mindset or a disposition toward facts in general. Either those facts will be believed and conceived to be creaturely or not creaturely. That God is the ground of all being, the mind of God, and that everything else that is not God derives and depends upon God, on his mind, purpose, and his redemptive plan of creation. So you've decided you know, in your claim that you don't hate God, that you don't believe in God, not because you're guilty of resistant unbelief, but that you're trying to communicate that you have non-resistant unbelief. I'm sure you would agree with that, right? Yes, I'm I'm not resistant. Because resistant unbelief would be Uh exemplify uh, one's hatred toward God. Right. Sure. Sure. Now, so you've decided that all the facts around you are not to be conceptualized or categorized as creaturely. Well, the only option that you have left is that the facts are standalone with respect to them necessarily deriving from God. So those facts, as far as you're concerned, exist with complete independence. Excuse me. You believe and you you. Stop me if you disagree. You believe that facts just simply exist, they're there, and they exist for whatever reason, but without the necessity of deriving and depending upon God. That's your position, right? Well, when you, what facts are you referring to? Okay, sir, any, any, any and all facts mm-hmm. you want to conceive of. If you look at the sure, fingernail on that. your pinky or you talk yeah. about the grass blowing in the wind, you believe, mm-hmm. you've decided because you're in a state of unbelief. Now I'm you convinced. think it, you, you, your position, you're in a state of, you're in a state of quote, claim state of unbelief. You characterized it as non-resistant unbelief. I will characterize it as resistant unbelief. Um, and we can discuss that later. But your position is is that, is that the, the the facts in question uh-huh. do not necessitate referencing the necessity of God. Right. Now, another way of putting that would be this: the facts themselves do not require, in order to be facts, to be conceptualized or categorized as creaturely. That the facts exist without the necessity of referencing of deriving from God. Now that's a that's a universal dictum. Now, on the other hand, if you adopted the Christian position that um, all facts that are not God derive and and depend upon God, that too would be a universal dictum. So there's no escaping a universal dictum. 
it will we will either we will either adopt God as the creator that all things universally derive and depend upon God, or all things universally do not depend upon God. So do you cool. realize that the both of us are involved in a universal dictum? When you say universal dictum, what do you mean by that? Just something we find? Well, regardless of how, what words we use to express it, we're both mm -hmm. giving universal propositions. All facts derive and depend upon God. All facts do not derive and depend upon God. Cool. I agree. Yeah. Or I could put it where if somebody wants to say, oh, I'm not denying that. I'm just, I, I just don't know. Or they play the I'm not sure game. But you see, they're invoking facts without the necessity of invoking and depending upon God. And so you, as well as myself, are involved in a, a position of universality. Either all facts universally that are not God derive and depend upon God, or the facts are invoked as actual and intelligible without reference to the necessity of God, which is that the latter is your position. So since you claim that your unbelief is not the product of resistant unbelief and hatred toward God, then you must have a rational basis for your universal position that all facts simply are without the necessity of referencing the necessity of God. That is your position, right? Yeah, sure. Good. Now, do you have a rational defense of that? Do I have a rational reason for that? Yeah, I do. Good. What is it? Now, remember, you have to support a universal claim. You can't merely appeal to your psychological uh, confidence. You're making a universal proposition. You can't just simply say, oh, I'm unconvinced. That doesn't address what your position really is. Well, I've been convinced that everything explained that I can understand does not necessitate a God in a, the explanation of it. Good. Then if, if it doesn't necessitate God, that is the equivalent of saying God isn't necessary. And the statement God isn't necessary is equivalent that God does not exist. So what is the universal basis, the ground of all being, as to why anything at all is? I don't know if there's one answer for that. Like, you want a singularity, universal? No, sir, sir, either, either you believe, either you mm -hmm. believe that there is one concrete thing from which all things derive and depend, or you believe that there is a plurality of things, okay, two or more things, some of which exist completely independent of each other, okay? Right. That there is, either you believe that there is a single ground of all being from which all things derive and depend, or you don't believe that there is a single ground of all being and that there will be multiple reasons why things exist. Either way, those are universal declarations. Do you understand that? Sure. Good. Now, how are you going to be able to rationally defend any position of universality that you are invoking? Either that there is a concrete singular thing that is the ground of all being that imposes everything that is, can be, or cannot be. Or you're going to have a universal that there's a plurality of things that exist in and of themselves, independent from other things that exist that are independent from other things. Either way, these are universal declarations. Do you agree with that last statement? Um, uh, for for so take a conversation, sure, I'll agree with it. Okay. I'm not, how are you going I don't to complete, defend? How are you yeah. going to rationally defend any universal declaration? How do you do it? You believe it, right? So the question is, why do you believe these universal declarations? On what rational grounds? Uh, through the process of the facts of uh, using the scientific method to come to understand something? No, the scientific method is not in a position to make universal declarations. Science is grounded in the process of induction. Okay. All, conclusions so in, all conclusions in science are provisional. 
and are subject to change reputation based upon right. a reexamination of the data or a new observation. In so what's science, wrong with that? well, the, 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 that's the that that position mm -hmm. that I've just explained about the nature of science mitigates against you being able to make a universal statement of truth. Science is not in the position of truth claims. Did you know that? I do know that. Yeah. So, okay. so science, I'm not making, science, I'm not making science, science, science comes up with provisional conclusions to explain certain regularities. Okay. Science is not in the position to tell us what the ground of all being is. We don't even know what the, the final substrate of everything is. There are speculations about it. But you see, they're, they're, science is not in the business of making universal claims. So you cannot appeal to the scientific method in order to defend a universal declaration. I don't okay. see why so, not. Uh, because uh, because there are the, because there are no scientists either individually or collectively that are omniscient. You can't get a universal through induction, unless of course you're omniscient. I, I don't understand why you need to be. Are omniscient. any individual? Listen, do you know? What the, not, have you ever heard? Have you ever heard the term "the problem of induction"? Um, explain it to me. Science suffers from a major problem. It's called the problem of induction. You can't mm -hmm. get to an absolute from induction. Okay, I don't think science claims absolutes, though. And I'm not, I'm not right. Th that. Then, then, then you can't appeal to science to justify a universal declaration. Um, so you can... just, you've just caught. Listen to me. Okay. In all fairness, with the, I sure. don't think you realize it, but you've just contradicted yourself. All right. Cool. But you you so just I'm admitted a, that science. You've admitted sure. that science is is not in the position of telling us truth. Okay. It's it's there, using science using scientific method. You, you're not under, you're not understanding. Can I, you, you're can not I you're not understanding the scientific can we converse? method. Can, can we converse? Yes, but you're okay, repeating cool. yourself again. I no, don't I'm want not. you to just, repeat what I've already repeating. refuted. I'm so it is pointless. Just, okay, listen. I'm going to elaborate. It is pointless. It is okay. pointless for you to invoke science again. Okay. Can I just elaborate what I'm using the scientific method? I on? want it, you. You you appeal to science. Are you, you not? Yes. So here's okay. the, here's the situation. Do you now admit that Darth, it is useless Darth, to appeal Darth, to? Okay. Darth. Thank you for thank you for okay. thank this, you for this, thank you for coming up, yeah. James. Have a nice day. Okay, you're done. This is the shtick that James always does. Okay, he first invokes an appeal to scientific methodology in an attempt to establish a universal declaration that will ground his atheism. But then he just admitted that science is not in the business of making such absolute claims. Okay, but he wants to go into bickering mode. This is what happens when atheists get cornered, and I have no stomach for bickering. I do have a stomach for rigorous uh, intellectual debate, but not bickering. Okay, and James has done this quite often, so we're done. Now, if anyone else would like to come up, you're free to come up. Raise your hand. Uh, could you repeat the question you asked me that I was having trouble with? You, you gave that? me a dichotomy about. Um, Oh, I, I can't even remember what it was now. I was trying to think about it, and it's gone. Um, I said that all facts that are not God are either creaturely or not. Well, I don't feel like I'm a creature. I have no knowledge of being creaturely in that sense. Okay, well, then, like, then what your position then entails, whether you realize it or not, is that for all facts, therefore, before you are brute. And by brute, meaning there is no ultimate ground of being that you can invoke and defend. I don't know what the ultimate ground is. That still okay, could be so, so, so you've now, you have now agreed with me that you, when you invoke propositions and facts, that they are not classified or categorized as creaturely they are because you refuse to acknowledge them being creaturely then by default 
is that they're brute facts. They have no ultimate identifiable ground or being as to what makes anything what it is, can be, or cannot be. There's not an identifiable grounding. In the Bible, it teaches us in Colossians 1, in Hebrews 1, okay, uh, in John 1, it explains that Jesus Christ is not only the Savior, but he's the Lord of creation, and that he is the creator. He creates and sustains everything. He's the ground of all being. But when you reject that, okay, you think that you are you have the capacity to invoke the actuality and intelligibility of facts, but you're not acknowledging the lordship of Jesus Christ for those facts. So then those facts are brute facts. Okay. Now, you don't there's not a third alternative. Now, if you want to tell me, well, they're not brute facts, well then you can tell me what it is that is singularly the ground of all being as to why anything is, can be, or cannot be. Is it, do you have something that's identifiable and defensible? I do not, no. Then for you, all facts are brute. It doesn't matter if you say to me, well, the apple grew from a seed. I put the seed in there. I watched it every day and grow. Okay, when, when we look at your chain of discovery or your causal connections, it will always terminate in I don't know, right? So do you acknowledge that whatever series of facts that you invoke, that they will always terminate or its originating point will be I don't know? Rather than the apple has its origination in the mind, the purpose, and the plan of the triune God? Well, it's definitely not that one. I don't have that knowledge. Okay. So for you, all putative facts are brute, aren't they? They very well may be. I'm going to have to consider this some more. No, 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 sir, sir. The issue is I'm talking about from your perspective. Yeah, I am. You are either going to acknowledge that that the facts, the putative facts in question are creaturely. And if you refuse to acknowledge the creaturely of said facts, then whether you realize it or not, uh, in a de facto way, you are embracing the bruteness of those facts. Okay? That they have no ultimate, identifiable, defensible uh, point of origin as to not only not only chronologically, but contemporarily as well. It's not just chronological. You see, in... Um, in John and in Colossians 1, it refers to Jesus Christ being the creator of all things, right? Hebrews 1, it refers that he's the, the sustainer of all things. So we have a chronology of, of facts, and we also have the contemporary status as to why there are facts in God. But for you, your facts are brute, right? Because you don't. You don't have an identifiable ultimacy that you can instantiate. Now, if you could, then you wouldn't be in a situation where your facts are brute. Now, if your facts are brute, then they're uninterpretable. There's no identifiable reason why anything is. Now, you might say, well, there's causation, there's laws of nature. Well, what makes that real? You're going to go, oh, I don't know. So when well, you I reject the, yeah, go ahead. I would, sorry. No, go ahead. I would also go ahead and straight up say that I wouldn't presuppose that life has some meaning inherently within itself. Like, well, but you see, even, fact, even that statement, even those propositions wouldn't would have no interpretability. What 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 would mean by what would meaning mean? What would life mean? There's there's whatever you invoke is the case, right? It has its actuality or ontology, and it consequently its interpretability or intelligibility will either be intrinsic to itself, innate, that it's self-contained, absolute. 
or not. So, for example, so, many unbelievers, when they hear uh, a biblical presuppositional presentation, they go, well, your God is brute. No, because the, the, the God communicates that he is self-contained. He's eternal. He doesn't begin to exist. He, he you know, without beginning again. He, he is not derivative or dependent upon anything that is not himself. So God, by definition, is not brute. Now, if somebody wants to tell me of a particular fact that is self-contained, absolute, unconditionally non-dependent within itself, good, go for it. We'll see how that works out. So when you reject the self-identity claims of Jesus Christ in the Christian scriptures, then you fall into the abyss of absurdity for everything. Why? Is because you will have no worldview frame of reference for the interpretability of anything. But you think you do. You say, oh, well, I, I have an interpretation. Well, that's a dog. It's wagging itself. Good. What's a dog? What, what makes something a dog? Then you're going to appeal to genetics and chemistry and physics. Well, what makes that real? So, so you see, in order for there to be interpretability for anything, whether it be rocks on the side of the road or water you know, flowing through rivers or a ballpoint pen or a cell phone, God has to be, on a worldview level, the first interpreter because he's Lord of creation, right? So even though there weren't cell phones, on day six, when God created the cell phone, that which is a tool that man reformulated the stuff that God made, would still be derivative of and subject to the mind of God and God's original interpretation of everything that is. But when you reject that God is the creator and God is the first interpreter, then the question is, how is interpretability of what anything is, can be, and cannot be, what's it based upon? My answer of I don't know is going to be entirely unsatisfactory. Well, it's it's worse than unsatisfactory. It's it's an acknowledgement of the absurdity of your position once you reject the self disclosure of God Himself through creation and through human history through Jesus Christ. This is why in Paul says in First Corinthians one and in three. Has not God turned the wisdom of the world into foolishness? Because now, anything you say as to what is, can be, it cannot be, if it is not ultimate metaphysically or at a worldview level grounded in the mind, the purpose, and, and, and the redemptive plan of God, God of the Bible, then I want to know why anything is what it is fundamentally. And you're going to be left with, I don't know. You know, when I talk with Lawrence Krauss, and I, I bring this up frequently because I think it's a tremendous example. Here we have somebody who has great notoriety, not only in the West, but in the world, uh, as a firebrand uh, foaming at the mouth atheist. And as a theoretical physicist, he's quite often brags, we don't need God. We don't need to appeal to supernatural woo-woo. We can explain everything through, through uh, the laws of nature. But when he was questioned on that, he completely collapsed and didn't want to discuss it anymore. Okay? And you can hear that on YouTube. Just type in Dart Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss. And so he was bragging, we don't need God. But then when I asked him, what is it then that is the ground of all being that institutes and secures every instance of what is, can be, and cannot be? What is it, Dr. Krauss? And he got angry because he knew that being a professional, somebody who appears in debates, college professor, a lecturer, author, okay? he appears in documentaries, that if he did assert it, then he would be subject to scrutiny. So we had a moment of transparency there. 
where he says, I don't know. So if he doesn't know what the ground of all being is, how does he know he doesn't need God? If he doesn't know what the ground of all being is, how does he know he can explain everything through laws of nature? You see the problem? No, I do see the problem. Right. If Even if we posit that something could be the ground of all being, we're not going to say it definitely is because fundamentally we don't know. Well, see, sorry, if I'm, I don't, holding, I'm, not try, I'm not trying to involve you and weave there. I'm sorry. That's okay. Look, if I'm holding a, whether I'm holding a rock on the side of the road that I picked up somewhere, right, that's been undisturbed since its origin, or a cell phone in my hand, both of them are, from the Christian perspective, are going to be creaturely. And so it's going to have an identifiable and defensible ontology and be con consequently, therefore, it's interpretable because interpretability will be grounded and rooted in the mind of God. Okay? But when you reject, as you have stated earlier, that you have no awareness, or so you claim, of God's revelation, which you do have an awareness of it. You just decide to believe a concept otherwise that is indefensible. Your position is reduced to absurdity. Deny the identity claims of Jesus Christ, and your position is reduced. This is the only final way that a believer can get an unbeliever to come to their senses, to come to repentance and their need to bow the knee to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to recognize when you, when you, when you deny the biblical worldview claims, when you deny the identity claims of Jesus Christ, the moment you do that, your position is reduced to absurdity. Everything is grounded in, I don't know. It, it, it may, I'm honestly more comfortable saying I don't know honestly than trying to falsely claim that God has revealed things to me that there, there's no, there's, there's, there's no truth or falsehood in your world because there's nothing that grounds truth and falsity in the Christian worldview. It is God himself who is the ground, the ground of truth. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth. And notice that the definite article is used. I am the truth. In, in it, from a biblical perspective, we say, what is, what, what, is, what is it that makes something true? Truth is whatever conforms to the mind of God. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But you see, you want to maintain in your rejection of God's self-disclosure of himself in creation and through human history, through the Bible, and ultimately through Jesus Christ. You want to believe that the concepts of truth and falsity have plausibility and applicability. Now, do truth and falsity have ontological applicability in your not-God world? Yeah, because because I would take a correspondence. Well, then what what is what is, what is the root what is the root of truth so that you can have uh, falsity? Okay, well, because in not order a to have to reality. Okay, yeah, but you see, reality is you is an abstraction. It's the set of all things. Whatever corresponds to the set of all things. Do you have access to the set of all things? No. Good. So then, so then you you don't have access to ultimate truth and falsity, do you? No, but I can still make claims hey, about what is truth true and, and truth false. Truth and falsity. No, no, you're true. But you see, you're in an open system as opposed to a closed system. In the Christian worldview, truth and falsity are derived by what conforms. Or does not conform to the mind of God, because it is the mind of God who creates the world. He he institutes what is, can be, and cannot be, and consequently, truth and falsibility only have ac applicability because of the mind of God and His plan, His redemptive plan of creation. When you reject that God is the ultimate ground of truth, there will be no identifiable 
ground of all being. There will be no ultimate truth from which all truths could be derived. So you're in an open system. Whatever claims of truth or falsity that you come to, they will always and forever be provisional. And whatever you believe today can be falsified tomorrow for everything. No, I do. I do agree with that stance. So, but don't don't you see? But do you understand that you are in an open system rather than the close a closed system? The mind of God is the ultimate basis of truth, from which all things derive and depend. When you reject that, you do not have an ultimate starting point. You don't have an ultimate truth from which all other truths derive and depend. I do agree that I don't. I don't have an identifiable starting point. There still could you be one, though, but I have not. A, you're in an open system. I, I, I would say yes, because I now, don't in have an a open specific system, thing. Right. Well, in an open system, truth and falsity are ultimately inaccessible. That whatever you deem to be true or false is is simply tentative. Yeah, it would be. Truth and falsehood would be tentative with reference to a time index. So, 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 yeah, no. Well, truth and falsity will always be provisional and aren't necessarily the case. Well, yeah, because because things can change over time. So, 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 so truth, so truth and falsity is finally inaccessible to you because you're in an open system. Well, it could be true right now and false later. Like those things can both be accurate. No, no you're, you're not understanding. No, 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 no. You're, 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 you're reifying truth there. You're, you're, you're confusing the label with the actuality. Okay? If something is actually true, it couldn't be falsified. Because it's true. As opposed to it being labeled as true. But something's state can change. Like my TV being on it can be true today and false yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, but okay, but but you see, but now you're changing the parameters of the proposition. Do you understand what you just did? Uh, I really don't. <laughs> Those are two different propositions. Okay, you said my TV could be on today but off tomorrow. Those are two different propositions. I okay, I kind of see okay. like. It being on would make it being off fall, like false, and then look, it being look, off. Look, you understand? Make, we're talking yeah. about when we're when okay. we're making a propositional claim from our perspective, it's time indexed. So you're introducing two different propositions, and what differentiates them are time indexes. Okay, TV's on today; it's off tomorrow. So we're not talking about the truth and falsity of a sim- single time index proposition. So before we move on, and I have to go in five minutes, um, you understand that you're, in an, open system. Going to, you're, in, an op- you're in an open system. You understand you know, I that? do. I do agree that I'm in, a, in an open system because I don't have an identifiable ultimate thing. Like but that makes me an open, open system. system by your then if you're in an open system, then in an open system, interpretability is never final there there you will never know okay that anything is the case oh, this goes back to everything there are certain things there are certain things within god's creation in the from the biblical perspective that we can never find out to be false because god purposes that we know it to be true okay so that because that's a closed system But you're in an open system, and therefore, this is why you don't find people who are knowledgeable in the philosophy of science talking about science is in the business of making truth claims. It's not. I don't think it is either, for the record. Good. So the bottom line here is when you reject the revelation of God, when you reject the self-identity claims of Jesus Christ, you are now in a self-positioned open system where truth and falsity are ultimately elusive. You could you can never appropriate that something is actually true. 
whereas in the Christian worldview, we can. That doesn't mean that we can uh, know that everything is true. We're not omniscient. But in God's plan, he has made us to know certain things that are true that cannot ever turn out to be false. But you're in an open system. Do you understand? One more thing. Do you understand the metaphysical consequences of being in an open system? I'm going to try and repeat it back to you to see if I'm understanding you properly here. What you're saying is because I admit that I can be wrong, because I admit that I don't know really anything, those two like factual statements about my belief states make me able to be well wrong about all my beliefs and because i could be right rightness about my and beliefs, wrongness are ultimately they... inaccessible are rightness and wrongness ultimately accessible i would suppose not because there you go you've yeah. just proven my point you no, I'm comfortable with that, though. <laughs> without, oh, so, see, but, but the reason why is because you're guilty of resistant non-belief. You would rather be in a world of uninterpretability and absurdity rather than bow the knee to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That is That is the noetic effects of sin. You're comfortable with that because your prime directive to use a Star Trek metaphor, is to preserve and protect your autonomy at all costs. And that includes even being comfortable with embracing absurdity. So what you just said in so many words is, Darth, I'm comfortable in being in a realm of complete absurdity. Now, you can choose to acknowledge what I just said is true or it's not true. So are you acknowledging that you're comfortable in a world where everything is absurd, because there is no ultimate truth. Well, there is no final uh, interpretability of anything. I wouldn't say it's absurd, though. I would say it might not be. Oh, okay. What if, if absurd? Okay. If I if I, it's it's absurd, not in a colloquial sense, but in a metaphysical philosophical sense, it's absurd. If I told you. If I told you that I jumped to the moon for lunch and came back, and then I swam the Atlantic Ocean and saw the Queen of England, and then I ran back on the top of the water, you would say that's absurd, right? Okay. And you would say it's absurd either because it's unintelligible or it is completely mitigated by other strong beliefs that you hold that are true. Yeah. The second option. But you see, right. But you see, your position is guilty of both. There is no interpretability for anything. Your mind is not what institutes the ontology of things. Right? So, but interpretability means that the conceptualization and categoriz- categorization that you have actually represents what the ontology of something is, right? Do you agree that interpretability and intelligibility will only be in virtue of the ontology of the thing in question? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're in agreement there. But you see, you cannot ground what the ontology of anything is, can you? No. And since you don't, since you don't have a, an identifiable and defensible ontology at a worldview level, you therefore don't have interpretability or intelligibility. You have intelligibility in a colloquial sense. You know, you can say, oh, the pizza's hot. We're t- when I talk about interpretability and intelligibility, I'm talking beyond a colloquial sense because your mind is not what establishes ontologically the interpretability and intelligibility. Okay. If a schizophrenic comes along 
um, and he says to you that the th furry thing wagging its tail is a dog, and that's their classification of it and their intelligibility for it. But from our perspective, it's a dog. Does their mental state actually impose the interpretability of it? No, it doesn't. So there's no frame of reference for which you to ground anything. And because you have no frame of reference, you have no ontology that you can instantiate, and therefore you have no interpretability for anything. Therefore, what you think makes sense makes no sense at all, because how does it make sense based upon what? Because everything you came, claim to believe ultimately is reduced to, I don't know. Or I could be wrong about it, yeah. No, no, no. The, there is no right or wrongness in your, 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 your world. Right and wrongness is never attainable. Surely you would agree, for the sake of argument, in the case of the Christian worldview, right and wrongness for certain things because of God's plan is apprehendable. It's attainable because it's a part of God's plan. Well, my name's not Hurley, world, but I do agree. But in you see, in your not Christian worldview, rightness and wrongness are never fundamentally accessible. You may think that something's right and wrong, but because in your ultimate system, you, it's never attainable. So absurdity... If, if, if you and I say that anything that somebody says to us, that it's, it's absurd, right? Like, for example, if, uh, I mean, it could, it could be anything. Whatever we classify as absurd, it will either be without interpretability or meaning, or the proposition in question is completely conflicted in terms of some other proposition that we deem to be true. But in your worldview, truth is ultimately unattainable and interpretability is ultimately unattainable right so as a consequence everything at a worldview level is absurd there's no no final worldview context to say what anything is do you have a final context as to why you can invoke and instantiate why anything is? Not an identifiable one. There's theoretical right. ones, but there's nothing identifiable. So if I tell you if I tell you the picture has a headache and won the marathon, right? It's an impressive picture. Well, yeah, but the at the point is if you just if you if you just simply say, um, well, that's ridiculous, well, based upon what? To decide whatever is meaningful and intelligible. What is it? Well, for you, it's, I don't know. So your position is, well, I'm comfortable with that. You said it, not me. Well, I, I, I said I am more comfortable with saying I don't know than claiming a falsehood. No, you're either, you will either be comfortable with bowing the knee to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, or you're going to be comfortable with denying it. And denying that means that you are embracing a worldview which is absurd. Why? It's because nothing means anything. And the reason why it doesn't mean anything is because the human mind is not God. Therefore, the human mind doesn't institute and secure what anything is, can be, or cannot be. Does it? Oh, no. Does this, no. Okay. So, so that the interpretability that somebody may express doesn't make it true.